control to him. Yes, awesome. Uh, I'm going to share the right screen first. So hopefully everyone sees my, my slide deck. It's really, really colorful. Uh, uh, today's talk is about SQL Server Security, and uh, I welcome you all. Uh, my name is Matthias Lind. I work as the senior Microsoft Data Platform and Business Intelligence Architect. I usually call myself a SQL geek uh, yeah. at Society. Matthias, uh, we're not yes. seeing your deck, we're seeing your desktop. You see my desktop, okay. It's a beautiful dog, though. Shame. Yeah, it is, it is. She's beautiful. <laughs> so, there we go, now we see. Are it. you seeing the right screen now? Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm just turning back to my, my, uh, my, my initial slide here as well, the colorful one. Uh, and the, this is a color team that uh, will follow the full session. So I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Uh, so, once again, welcome. Hopefully you see me now. Uh, right now I'm wearing glasses and have a bit more beard. Uh, as I said, I'm working for, for a company called Society. We are like worldwide and doing a lot of different IT stuff. And my focus is the Microsoft Data Platform and BI. Uh, I've been an MVP on SQL Server for a few years now and uh, also been a certified trainer for close to 15 years. Uh, you, you have my contacts here on the screen, so, so I, I think you will have it in the shared desktop as well afterwards. Uh, today's content is about security and the SQL Server security. My, my, my initial thought about this was actually setting up SharePoint and the Microsoft BI uh, and uh, the challenges we have with, with the, the double hop problematic in Kerberos authentication. Uh, so, so that's the basis of, of this session. So, so we're going to talk about this authentication, what it is. We're going to talk about logins, Windows authentication. We are going to talk about server roles, database users and roles. Uh, and the new feature we got a few years ago uh, called partial contained databases. And then we're going to dig into the Intel and Kerberos problematics. Uh, I'm going to switch back and forth in the screen between the slide deck and uh, over to the console. Uh, today I'm actually running on uh, SQL Server 2016, uh, CTP 2.2, I guess. So you can find it again. So hopefully everyone has installed it already and started to play around with it. Uh, this is a fresh install. I just installed it. It was done for like 30 minutes ago, so, so I don't have any prepared uh, uh, scripts or so in, in the console, but I think we're going to work it through anyways. Uh, right now I'm just picking up PowerPoint so I can have it on the right screen. Perfect. Uh, so, so these are the the content, uh, and if we start start with authentication, so authentication is just a uh, process of, of validating connection. Uh, if you have a server that uh, exposes a service that we want to connect to, uh, we, we we need to, to prove who who we are. Uh, uh, so, so we're actually making sure that the right users consume the right content. Uh, authentication for SQL uh, occurs in the different levels, and I usually say it happens on the server level, first of all, just to make the connection, and then it happens on the database level to, to give us uh, access to the specific data itself. Uh, so to get authenticated, we need to have an SQL server login. And uh, we can use the uh, variety of different methods. Uh, I usually prefer Windows authentication, but that's probably not the only option we have to have in the reality, because some applications uh, cannot use Windows authentication. We have a legacy and so forth. So describe this. A SQL Server login can be a SQL Server login based on the name with the password. 
Uh, this is something that exists in the local instance, uh, and the, the authentication is done by SQL Server. Uh, the other way of authenticate is by using Windows authentication. Uh, and by this means is you are a Windows user uh, that belongs to a group or as an individual security principle, uh, you are referenced into the SQL Server as a login. Uh, based on your SID, uh, your account exists in Active Directory or in the local uh, security accounts management database. And SQL Server use your identity to approve your access to connect to the SQL Server. And this is what it's all about. It's about connecting to the specific server. Uh, we configure this on the server level. Uh, you probably already know this. Uh, first of all, when we do the installation of the SQL Server, uh, we can choose between Windows authentication only or mixed mode authentication. Uh, and uh, in this uh, setup, I chose the mixed authentication, so I support both ways of authenticate. So I'm going to just graphically create the login. I usually don't do that. I usually use the T-SQL syntax instead. Uh, but just to show what we are creating. Uh, so the login can be either Windows authentication or SQL Server authentication. So if you start with the SQL Server authentication login, uh, it has to have a name. I'm just uh, typing test one, and it has to have a password. And I usually try to be quiet while I'm typing. Uh, this login uh, can use the, the password policies we have on a uh, Windows box. Uh, it's set by uh, local security policies or by group policies where we enforce uh, password expiration, length, complexity, and so forth. Uh, we can also use the must change password in the next login, and that means that if the user are using uh, the the SQL connectivity client tools, it actually will have a an, uh, ping back with, with, with the, an option of changing the password. But if the user are using a, 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 a custom application, the application might not uh, be able to, to help the user to change the password. Uh, this login can also be mapped to a certificate. That this means that we can actually have a certificate signing a login, and we can have a signed uh, application uh, and have an automatic authentication through the certificate. We can also use uh, an, a symmetric key, and we have something called credentials, which I will come back to. Uh, right now, I'm just disabling the password policies altogether, uh, and this means that I don't need to have a strong password. I can use a password that contains like zero characters, and that's a good password. Uh, if we ask the developers, which are a target for this session. Uh, so, of course, uh, login should always have a strong password. So, by doing this, I can actually connect to the database engine by typing the login name and its password. We see here, I'm now connected to uh, my SQL Server instance as the user test one. And on this instance, I can see databases and so forth.
right now I'm just typing a query. And exposes the username I have in my connection, but this is not my login name. If I want to see my login name, I can use the as user underscore name function instead. And let me see, I'm connected to the server as test one. I'm going to show you this through the activity monitor as well. So if we look at the initial connection here, we see I have the connection of the speed 55. And going to the activity monitor, if you look at the connection 55, I'm test one. Uh, you actually see the connection 54 as well. I have two connections to the server as the user test one. And the 54 connection, the session, is actually my object explorer. So if I'm disconnecting that one, it will eventually also uh, disappear from here. Eventually, so so we have a session that needs to time out, and uh, but by that disappear. Going back to the slide deck again. So the SQL Server login name and, and password. This is an old way of authenticate users. We can also use the Windows users in all groups, uh, and in Active Directory we have something called and SID or uh, Global Unique Identifier to identify a specific user in a specific domain. Same way again, I'm going to create a new login and this time it's going to be based on Windows authentication. So when I press the search button in the dialog box, I can actually Search for other objects, built-in security principles, groups, and users. And I usually tend to like to have logins based on groups rather than users. So I would actually just checkbox the groups as well. Uh, I don't know why uh, groups not are chosen by default, but, but uh, I always like to have it with me. Then I decide on what database am I going to search for a username or a group? And this is the local uh, security accounts manager in the local server, or it's based on the domain and my active directory forest. So I decide to search in active directory, try to find a um, username or group name. In this case, I'm going to search for groups which I have prepared a few. And I'm choosing a domain local group called grpdl SQL login. Uh, and by that, a Windows user can actually connect to the server. Right now I'm going to switch over to my domain controller. Uh, in my domain, I have a few users. I have a user called user1 and I have a user called user2. Uh, I also have a few groups. Uh, and the group we are looking at right now is the group called DL SQL login. Uh, I'm going to do create a member in this group. That's to describe. 
how to do it. And this will be the test one user. This will be removed in, in just a short while. Oh, demo one. This Windows user in the Active Directory will become a member of this group. Uh, now I have actually a few others as well. So I have demo one, demo two, and demo three. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to show you so, some of the steps with this. So switching back to the original SQL instance again. And I'm going to open up the command prompt, make it a bit more readable. So I hope everyone can see what I'm typing right now. I'm going to use the run as function. And log on. Actually creating a few sessions for, for the command shell, first of all. So demo one user will also be a bit more visible. I'm going to change the colors and the font. I'm going to do the background yellow in this one so we see the difference. And we're going to start on session for demo two as well. And I actually need to type the correct password. The green can be good for the background. And this is uh, green ninja mode. So we have two sessions right now uh, in my environment where I can start the SQL command prompt and connect to the local instance. And you see it worked for the user one. I'm going to try with the second user as well. And you see it failed for the second user. Uh, and this means that uh, the demo one user is connected to SQL Server uh, and the secondary Windows user cannot connect. Uh, going back to the domain controller. I'm going to do the user to member of the group. So now we know the user is a member of the group. Same group as user one. So going back again and try to connect. We still see it fails. And this is due to how Windows works with, with, with the with, with the 
authentication. So when a computer starts, we have a service that actually pops up a, a, a dialog box or actually giving us the option of logging on to the computer. And when we log on to the computer, the local security authority, which is an internal service process, part of the Windows executive services, uh, that actually do a um, login uh, in the local machine or against the domain and do a lookup for the username and trying to match the password in the local computer or in the domain and then create something called an access token for the specific session. And this occurs only during login. And this access token will never ever be changed unless the user logs out and log in again. So I'm going to simulate a logout for the second user and then you log in. So now it creates a, a new access token for this user, uh, actually puts the membership of the group into the username and the user's access token. So I can, from here, actually do a connection. Uh, uh, going back to the login again, we remember the login is actually based on the group and not the user itself. Uh, but when we are looking at the return of the as user underscore name function, we actually get the specific username. Uh, and, and this is due to the how Windows treat this. The user itself is the user who is presenting themselves to the server with, with the access token uh, and through an inherent through the group membership the user can get validated. Uh, I can of course create a login directly for a specific user but that will be pretty much the same thing. as uh, having an SQL server login for a specific user. Uh, and once again, I need to remember how to type my passwords. It might happen that my dog barks when she gets back home from her walk. Uh, if so, I apologize. I'm going to change the fonts here again. And the colors, this one will be bluish. Right now we have three users. Connected. To the server. And this is no news. This, this is something we had for years. Uh, these users uh, can be validated either through a SQL Server login or with a Windows user. Uh, when we are working with the Windows user, we are, are having an, some, the, the access token that actually are the, uh, the ID card the connecting session actually shows to the SQL Server engine. Uh, we have something called server roles, and this is uh, 
and way of us of actually delegate specific administrative control to the server. Uh, and normal user is just a consumer of data, uh, and uh, this user do not need any administrative control of the server. Uh, DBAs or Windows Server admins or backup operators, they might need to have a bit higher uh, permission on the server side. So for them, we can actually assign server roles. Uh, there is a set of fixed server roles, and there are possibilities since SQL Server 2014 to actually create custom server roles. So switching back again, it's a lot of back and forth, back and forth. So by first looking at one of these users, we can take the demo3 user, for example, uh, and switching over to the status. So the thing for a user to actually get connected to the server is actually the permission set to connect to database engine rent. Uh, I can deny the user to connect to SQL Server, uh, and this will actually occur. when the user logs out from the server engine and tries to connect back again. Grant or deny. So this is explicitly denying. Uh, a normal option is actually just disabling a login instead. I'm going to enable it first, just to show you it works to re-enable it. And also disable the account. Uh, and uh, if you see the uh, messaging back from the connection is when the account was uh, denied to connect, you just got the login failed for user. But when you disable the user, you actually got the reason of the uh, non-connectivity as well, that the account is disabled. If I require uh, password policies and have uh, password expiration and such, actually a user might get locked out. And in that case, you will see that the user is locked out here by having this specific checkbox checked. Uh, and by default, this would occur after three failed login attempts. And to enable a locked out account, you just go to the account itself and uncheck the login is locked out and press OK. So going back to server roles. Server roles is a set of specific administrative privileges a user can achieve. Uh, and uh, any normal user should only be a public Oops, sorry, uh, really, really bad response in the drawing, public. Uh, and this means that the user is just allowed to connect to the SQL server. If the server needs to have higher permissions, for example, working as an administrator or, or similar, you can give the user sysadmin permissions, and this means that the, serv the, the user will actually be an um, full sysadmin with full permissions all over this specific SQL server. We can set up other kind of server roles as well as db creator. This could enable 
uh, developers having the permissions to create their own databases. Uh, we can have the server admin to, to elevate uh, administrative control to parts of the server service itself. Security admin to work with logins and roles and so on. If you want to have that in, in depth, I would recommend go to a specific SQL Server Administrative course. If you look under server roles, we see these roles again. And if I open up the sysadmin role, for example, uh, we can see who is the members of this role. And you see here, I have a group for SQL admin logins. Uh, and I usually do it like this. Uh, I generalize uh, administrative responsibilities of, of an S SQL server. And uh, by that means is I'm creating just a single Windows Active Directory group, uh, which I assign connect to SQL. Uh, these permissions are set aut automatically when I'm creating the login. So I'm going to create an administrative login right now. need to select the entire directory and I also need to add the groups. So this will be a Windows authenticating administrative group. This group uh, will be assigned the specific server role, in this case, sysadmin. Uh, it could be uh, that this user is just uh, a uh, disk admin or a security admin and or. And in that case, I just choose the specific server roles, with, which is, in that case, limited to a smaller set of permissions on the server level. Uh, by creating a user as a sysadmin, I actually don't need to create any user mappings because that user will automatically become database owner in every database on the server. I do not need to set the specific permissions either as it's uh, sysadmin, I have full permissions. And I don't need to do anything about granting. I'm just assigning the group and setting the role. Right now we have this created already. I did that during setup. I'm sorry for that. So here we can look at the group itself. Sysadmin. And uh, here I was about to create a mistake because this group was actually the normal login group. Here we have it. So by showing the differences here as demo three, I'm gonna see if you can log in again. And then just to demonstrate, we can try to create a database. And we see we don't have the permissions of doing it. So I'm going to log this user out. Go back to Active Directory. Log at this user. looking at the member of and adding membership to the admin login group. And then jumping back. Connecting. It 
showing us that we are connecting connected as the specific user demo three. Then I'm gonna try to create a database. And now you see it worked. I can show you the database by refreshing. And if we look at the owner of the specific database, we see it's demo three, who is the owner. So this means that uh, by using Windows groups instead of, of uh, of SQL logins, we can actually connect and do stuff on the server. If you look at these roles, we can actually nowadays create new server roles as well. Uh, why would we like to create server roles if we want to delegate specific permissions to specific parts of the server, to specific administrators, group admins, or or, or similar, uh, we can create them now. Uh, usually here in Sweden we don't uh, separate the administrative tasks that much, so usually you are a sysadmin or you're not. Uh, so that's how we usually do it here. And when we are talking about security, uh, if you are an administrator, you are an administrator. And as long as you have connect physical connectivity to the server itself, you can probably do whatever you want if you are a domain admin. So, so we separate on that level. Uh, but just a um, login or a server role doesn't give you access to data. So you actually need to be a database user as well. And here we have one of the things around Windows authentication, which is awesome. Uh, if you can see yourself managing a, an uh, environment with like 20, 30, 40, 50 database servers, uh, a few thousand databases and working with a few thousand users, and these users are running applications that are uh, connecting to these databases, and they are using uh, SQL Server login authentication. That means that you need to create uh, a huge set of logins for all these users. And these logins must have passwords, and these logins need to be associated to database users. So this means that it's an uh, administrative nightmare, actually. And by using Windows authentication, we can actually use a single Windows user group uh, to uh, authorize the connectivity to the server, and then we can create database users mapped to these specific groups or other groups. Uh, so, for example, you have one group for a login, for doing logins to the server. Uh, then you create role-specific groups uh, for the application. For example, database readers, database writers, and such. Uh, and then you actually tie those role-based groups to the database as users. Uh, besides database users, uh, we also can have something called database roles, and this is a way of us actually grouping permissions to objects within the database, uh, so, so it's easier to associate permissions to these objects to the users. As I said, we can have roles for specific tasks in the application, for example, order management, uh, for example, uh, staffing and such. Uh, what we must remember is at, that uh, database role is not the group, it's actually a permission set. 
so I usually describe a database role equal to the permission set full control or the permission set modify in Windows. Uh, it's actually a grouping of, of permissions to objects, uh, which actually easing up the way of assigning permissions to users. Uh, besides database roles, we also can have something called application roles. And an application role is a permission set with the password that we can use to elevate permissions for a specific session. And this is a bit old school, uh, but I still see it from day to today uh, when I'm helping customers with security problems. Uh, the bad thing with the application roles is actually the inherited permissions are uh, left in the session for the user until the user disconnects and reconnects again. Uh, so we cannot de-elevate the permission set from the application role. So jumping over to this part. Uh, looking at this database, we see the database and we have security stuff. We see we have something called database users and we see we have a specific database user for the login SQL Server 1, which is uh, the service account. Uh, we also see a user called DBO, and if you look at that user, we see it's actually the login name Demo3, which is the user that created this database. Uh, creating users to a database is done by adding new users or typing create user syntax and the options we have is SQL user with the login or SQL user without the login. User map to certificate, user map to a symmetric key or a Windows user. Uh, so a user with a login is actually and direct mapping to a login. And this is the old way of actually uh, uh, creating database users, mapping a specific login to a specific username. Uh, this actually generates, if I have 10 databases in this server, and we have 10 different users in these 10 databases, indirectly, if we want to have the applications disconnected, we need to have a hundred logins. So uh, Adam, uh, the user in the environment, uh, connects as Adam to application one for database one. That means one login for application one, database one. Uh, if Adam also needs to connect to uh, database two, used by application two, we usually see uh, a new login for Adam uh, for application two, database two. And that means that Adam need to have control of two different sets of passwords and maintain passwords during updates and such. Uh, and this will create an administrative nightmare. Uh, the user, when it runs the different application, will be uh, securely separated from each other, by, but they will uh, also be two different uh, security principles. Uh, so this is the old school way of doing it. Uh, if we are having a, a SQL user without a login, uh, we type the username, and this could, for example, be uh, a user uh, that, that actually inherits through database changing uh, between different databases on the same server. Uh, we can also make a user map to certificate. In that case, we need to have a certificate that we are associated with this user, and that means that we can sign a procedure, for example, uh, in database A. And that procedure is signed with the certificate that we also create a user in database B. So the procedure can communicate to the other database. Uh, of course, we can do this with an asymmetric key as well. So the difference between a certificate and, a, and, and an asymmetric key is actually how we set up the 
identity itself. Or it can be mapped to a Windows user. And this Windows user is, as you see here, a login. And that login is fetched like this. Uh, but if I want to do this, not with the login, but with an, an another Windows group, I can actually type the Windows group name here. The domain is demo, and the group is called grp underscore dl underscore database underscore readers. If I'm not mistaken myself, I'm just jumping over to the domain controller and do a quick lookup. We have a group here called database reader and database writer. I'm going to call this readers and press OK. Uh, I'm also jumping out of the SQL engine and going to clean up some in the domain. So we have our users again. I'm going to go to demo one. Remove the membership ship from the login. Remove. Yes. Could do this on all three of them. Then I jump into my groups. So we have a group for standard login and we have a group for admin login. Quick jump back to the engine again. And look at the server security. We have the admin login which is connected to the sysadmin and we have the standard login which is just public. And then we have a database and in this database we have readers. So what I'm doing is taking the database reader group and making that member of the SQL login group. And I'm letting the database writer group be a member of the login group. So this means that these two groups actually owns membership of the groups for doing logins. So this could, for the database, be different roles in the database. Uh, then we have an application. This application is member of the reader group. And this is a global group. And I'm going to assign user 1, 2, and 3 as members in this group. So this means that these users actually can connect to the database right now. Uh, I'm also going to the manager group and adding demo3 user. Uh, this manager group is a writer in the database. So now we have two groups for connecting to the server. 
the users are only associated to the login group uh, through the database access role groups. Okay. We're jumping back again the SQL engine. Doing exits on all three. As the group membership has changed for these ones. Then I'm just going to create connect as user three. Really, really fast. And also connecting as user one. And before I'm letting them connect to the SQL engine, I'm actually just doing a quick look again, changing creating a new database. Really, really fast. And in that database, create a table. like this and adding a default for login name showing you the data You see, we can actually add data. Uh, we haven't uh, added a, a user permissions to this data yet, so, so I'm going to show you as user one, use demo, go. The principal is not allowed to connect. We're going to do it as user one as well. Uh, they are not allowed, but they are allowed on the server. So quickly create users, new user, a Windows user, the username, which has to be a group. Data reader. Without login. And you see it actually types the username or the group name in the property box for the login name, even if we don't have a login for that specific group. Now we see we can connect. 
even if the specific user, the specific group is not a login. It's only existing outside of the SQL engine, only existing in the Active Directory. Uh, right now I see the time just flies, so I'm jumping back to the slide deck again. Uh, this stuff is maybe all news. Uh, what I've seen is uh, going from using logins uh, and uh, logins based on SQL Server logins or Windows tied directly to a database user and switching over to separate groups. Uh, I, I see faster login times, uh, I see easier user management. Uh, we have something called partial contained databases. A partial contained database is actually a database user with a password. It, it, the database user with the password can also be a Windows user. Uh, it's not having a login, so, so you only create it in the database itself. Uh, you need to enable uh, partial containment on the server level, and you need to enable partial containment on the database itself. Uh, so you configure this on three levels, on the server, on the database, and in the user. Uh, the database user, which you are connecting with, inherits the permissions to connect to the server. This means that this user can only connect to objects that is this specific database. So to enable partial containment, you first need to go to the server object. I'm not going to show you this other than how to connect, con enable contained databases. And then on the database level, activate containment type partial. So by having this on the database level, we can actually create. Uh, oh, sorry, I need to disconnect all connections to the database because I cannot change this as long as I have users connected to it. That would be like cutting off the branch you are sitting on. And with this, we can actually create a user, new user. SQL user without login. SQL user with a password. Username contained password. Uh, Mm. Oh. Once again, you need to type the passwords correctly. So, if we are looking here at the logins, refresh, we see that the login doesn't exist. Uh, we remember the name was contained and the passwords were secret, so I'm switching over here to do an Way is that connect 
database engine. And this was interesting. You have to get, tell it what database to connect to for a contained user. Yeah, I just remember that. I need to specify that one when I do the connection. First again. And by that you see the limited, I'm going to close down these ones, the really limited connection in the Object Explorer. And this is usually what we always want to see. Uh, so the last stuff I wanted to mention here in the session is the stuff about the element Kerberos. I think uh, we will have a uh, separate session, uh, really, really deep dive into this one if people need to leave or if uh, the go to webinar is closed after 8. Uh, I'm going to do a quick review here. Uh, so the NTLM, NTLM manager is the old way of connecting ser to servers in, in the Windows environment. It's uh, heritage back to the uh, old days with, with the uh, law manager and the collaboration between Microsoft and IBM. Uh, it's the first way of, of authentication protocol in, in a Windows environment since the Windows NT. Uh, we still have support for it. Uh, with, with Windows Server 2000 and Active Directory, we actually got Kerberos as the new school of doing connectivity. Uh, it's working a bit differently. So, so do a story, a long story short, I'm going to draw in this screen here. Uh, when we have uh, a domain, uh, we have computers joined in a domain. These computers can be clients, they can be servers. Uh, what this means is when the computer itself starts, it's actually authenticated to a domain. The domain contains user accounts and groups. Uh, to identify users, to, to group specific needs of uh, reaching access. The same stuff we have in the local account database called SAM. Uh, in, in the domain, we have domain users and we have domain groups that are in different flavors. Uh, in the old NTLM way, we only have global groups. Uh, and we have local groups in the uh, computer's uh, local databases. Uh, with Windows 2000 and Active Directory and forward, we have three flavors of groups in a domain. We have uh, global groups, which are used to group users, organize users into administrative units. Uh, we have universal groups if we have a multi-domain Active Directory Forest, so we can group global groups between domains into one security principle. And we have domain local groups for assigning permissions uh, to resources. Uh, and we usually work with putting users into groups and assigning permissions to the groups, uh, pretty much as I did uh, when I created the logins and when I created the database users. Uh, so. When a computer is joined to a domain and the user connects to the computer and logs on, he, he adds a username, a password, and he chooses the security boundary, either the local machine or the domain for logging on. When this occurs, uh, the client computer connects to the domain controller to validate the username and password. And if the username and password is correct, the domain returns the user SID, which is the unique ID for this specific user, and the list of SIDs uh, from which groups this user belongs to. Uh, 
The second step is that the client computer do a lookup in the SAM database and testing all these SIDs, both the user SID and the group SIDs, to the local account database and mapping these to local groups. Uh, this data is then returned and entered into something called an access token. And in this access token, we now have a huge list of SIDs, which then are looked up in the local machine against something called the security hive, in which we have the local security policies. And by that, we're actually assigning local permissions in the local machine. And this actually describes how a user can work in this local environment. Uh, and this is the same between Antelum and Kerberos. When we are talking about this, we are talking about the protocol used in between um, user machine and, uh, and server. So, uh, when we are working with NTLM, actually the computer creates an unauthenticated session to the service uh, as anonymous or everyone as we usually know it as. And in this session, it actually sends over the access token to the server service the server on the receiving end actually looks at the, this access token to see if it's containing SIDs from the local SAM database. And if it says it comes from the domain, it actually passes the access token up to, to a domain controller that validates if this is a correct access token or not. And if this is an, a correct access token, it actually sh changes the unauthenticated session to be authenticated. If this access token actually is something spooky, it means that the, the, it fails authenticating, and that means it leaves an open, unauthenticated session uh, that actually times out uh, when the server on the receiving end decides to time it out. It's usually up to 20 minutes. Uh, if this is good or bad, I would say this is actually a security vulnerability and it can actually be used to do uh, unauthenticated uh, actions on the service side. Uh, Kerberos authentication, on the other hand, uh, will have another color. I'm going to do it blue. Uh, with, with this, you actually have something called a um, key distribution center in a domain. That's the domain controller. Uh, and client actually asks the key distribution center for something called the session granting ticket, uh, which actually is sent as an authentication to the server that we are trying to connect to. This server uh, trusts this session granting ticket if it comes from a trusted key distribution center. And if it trusts it, it actually opens up an authenticated session in which the access token is delivered to. So by this mean, means that with the Kerberos authentication, uh, we have an actually a lower weight and safer way of authenticating the user. And if the user fails to authenticate, that means coming with a uh, faulty session granted ticket, the connect receiving server actually don't allow, allow the session itself to be created. This works great if you have a client server architecture, but if you have multiple servers, a mid tier server, for example, uh, this will generate a problem because when we are working with multiple servers, we have server one uh, or the computer one, then we have an application server in the, in the middle, and then we have the database server on this side. Uh, this machine can generate a session with this machine so they become trustees with each other, and that means that a user on this machine can be trusted here. But that doesn't mean that this user is trusted on the database level. So that means that this mid tier server actually need to be trusted to delegate the user information or actually do a way of impersonating this kind of session on this side. And by doing that, actually the database engine needs to have something called the service principal name. This service principal name uh, is an, uh, 
record in Active Directory uh, where we actually point out the specific database engine service instance uh, on which port. And then we actually uh, allowing the service account on the mid tier server to delegate uh, Kerberos authentication to this specific server. And that means that we are creating a way of uh, solving the problem with the double hop. Uh, everyone who's been setting up SharePoint uh, probably uh, know about a small application called SetSPN. SetSPN is the tool for creating these records. And what we need to do is on the service side here, create the service principal name for the account that runs the SQL Server Engine. And we need to allow the application account on this side actually being allowed to do um, impersonation and delegation of the Kerberos authentication. So we are creating a trust in between. Uh, I'm just closing down that one and going over to my Active Directory part. So, show you this part on the SQL engine here. Uh, right now I'm going to the SQL server computer object uh, and jumping into the advanced properties where we have something called service principal names. Here we add the service principal name and the service principal name for SQL server is MSSQL SVC. Then we need to add the fully qualified name for this server and that will be in this way SQL dot SQL zero one dot demo dot local and we usually add the port number here or we add the instance name. This is the default instance, so we don't have an instance name. Uh, a new feature since Windows Server 2012 is that we actually don't need to add the port here. Uh, it's solved automatically. If we have additional instances, we actually actually need to add the instances here. And when this is added, uh, both for the fully qualified domain name and the host name itself, We can go to the connecting server. In this case, I'm using a server object to trust this computer for delegation. And we only want to allow Kerberos only authentication, add. Then we point out the server we are trying to connect to, locating the service principal name on this server, pressing OK. And you see here it adds one for both the host name and the fully qualified domain name and applying. And by doing this, I'm telling that the mid tier server is trusted to delegate Kerberos authentication to SQL01. And with that said, with the fast wrap up, uh, where I spent 10% uh, of the time on the topic I was planning to spend 90% of the time. Uh, I'd say thank you. Great, thank you very much, Matthias. We appreciate you presenting for us today. Um, oh, well, I had Larry Ortega commented that no apologies necessary for the dogs. And uh, Thank you. <laughs> also, Dan Brennan and Charlene and Nay both said thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I saw that Tan is uh, starting to drop out slightly after 8, and I'm sorry for actually going over time. Uh, 
my environment were a bit uh, laggy, so, so I was trying to speed up uh, and being afraid of uh, actually uh, having a fresh install. Uh, I kind of lost a bit track, but I hope uh, you all enjoyed the session anyways. All right, and thanks, thanks to everybody for attending. And we'll have the recording up um, as soon as possible. And Matthias, if you can send me your slide deck, I'll get that put up there as well. Yes. Thank you so very much. Do. Thank you. Bye-bye.